Hello and welcome to our first class of O Level Physics 5054. Today we will begin with the first topic that is physical quantities. Now physical quantities are divided into two parts. We have a scalar quantities and vector quantities. Quantities that only have a magnitude but not a direction are called scalar quantities, whereas quantities that have both a magnitude as well as a direction are called vector quantities. Now we have to ask ourselves what exactly is a magnitude? Well, magnitude refers to the actual value of whatever quantity we are measuring. For example, if I say that an object has a width of 5 meters, 5 meters is a magnitude because it is the value of the length. For example, and similarly, if I say that a cyclist is traveling at 12 meter per second, 12 meter per second is the magnitude of the cyclist. Here are some more examples of scalar and vectors. We have distance, mass, speed, time, area, volume, density, temperature, and length as a scalar quantities. All of these have a magnitude, but they do not have a direction. We do not specify the direction when we measure the mass, for example. Similarly, displacement, velocity, acceleration, force, and momentum are all vector quantities. They have both a magnitude as well as a direction. Notice, however, that while distance is a scalar quantity, displacement happens to be a vector. So what exactly is the difference? Well, this should clear it up. Displacement, displa distance is how much an object actually travels to get from one point to another. It depends on the route we take. For example, if I say that this a school is 5 kilometers away from my house. However, there is a possibility that instead of going directly to the school, I first travel 10 kilometers to the market and then 12 more to the school, right? I could take whatever route I want. So distance refer to whatever route we take to get from one point to another. Whereas, whereas displacement is the actual distance between two points. So if I travel 10 kilometers to the market and then 12 more to reach, this, uh, to reach the school, my total distance traveled would be 22 kilometers, right? Whereas because, this, the, because the school is actually five kilometers from my house, the displacement is five kilometers. Displacement also has to be has to have a direction, right? Because it is a vector quantity. So I can say that the school is five kilometers north of my house. Five kilometers is the magnitude, whereas north happens to be the direction that I have to travel to get from my my house to the school. Displacement can also be positive and and negative. This is because displacement is always given uh, with relation to the current position, right? So if you're traveling in the opposite direction, we can say that's a negative displacement. And in, if, the same, if it's in the same direction, we can say it's a positive displacement. Secondly, even if an object travels, it is possible that the displacement is zero. This is not possible with distance because if an object has traveled, it must have covered some distance, right? This would clear it, this example will clear it up more. In the figure below, let's say a person starts from A. He travels three, three meters to B then 6 meters to C, then 3 meters again to D, and finally back at A. The total distance he travels is 3 plus 6 plus 3 plus 6, which is uh, 18 meters, right? However, his initial position was A, and his final destination is also A. So the displacement is in this case 0, because that person, in a sense, did not move at all, because his final, final position and his initial position is the same. So we can say that the total outcome of this movement was 0 meters because the person did not move. So the displacement is 0. Notice that displacement can all, would always be the shortest distance from two points, right? Because the, the distance can never be lesser than the, than the displacement. So to calculate the displacement, what we can do in scenarios is to make the, a straight line connecting the two points because that would always be the shortest route. So we can get the displacement by drawing a straight line across two points of which we have to calculate the displacement. In this case, the line cannot be drawn because both the initial initial position and the final position, that is both are two points, were A. So there was no line and there was no dot. So in this case, the displacement was zero. Okay, with that done, next up we have, as we can see, speed is a scalar quantity and velocity is a vector. Velocity is a vector because it is always given with a direction. So if I say that a cyclist is traveling at 12 meter per second, I am not giving its velocity, I am giving its speed because I have not specified in which direction it is going. 
But if I say that the object is traveling at, if the, the cyclist is traveling 13 meter per second towards left or at or east or at a bearing of 0, 060, all these give a direction, right? We can say that the cyclist is traveling west, so that's a direction. So in that case, you would be giving the velocity. This is why velocity is a vector, whereas speed is a scalar. Another thing we can notice here is that for speed to change, we have to change the magnitude. For, because only if, like if a cyclist was traveling at 12 meter per second, only if he travels at a speed greater or lesser does, a, does the speed change. But in velocity, this is not true. A change in direction would also mean a change in the velocity. So if, a, if let's say at constant speed, a cyclist takes a turn around the road. His direction ch changes, but his magnitude does not. So in this case, the speed remains constant, whereas the, the velocity, which is the vector quantity, changes. So what we're trying to say here is that a change in direction does result in the change in velocity, even if the magnitude remains same. Acceleration and force also are always have directions. So we say that th those two are also vector. Well, here are some base sum SI units and uh, of uh, several uh, physical quantities that we would study in our syllabus. Uh, for mass, we have kilogram with its symbol kg. Time is measured in seconds, symbol s. Distance is measured in meter, m. Temperature is measured in Kelvin. You can also, sometimes we also use centigrade here, but the SI unit is considered Kelvin. The symbol is a capital K. Current, for current, it's ampere, A. Luminous intensity is measured in candela with the unit CD. Uh, one important thing here to notice is that the, that the symbol for mass the name of the unit for mass is kilogram and not gram. This is a bit confusing because usually we add kilo to make other units, but here for mass, the SI unit is a kilogram because a gram is too small a unit for comparison. Also, another thing is that we must make sure that we use the correct case when writing the symbol. For example, the symbol for Kelvin is a capital K. We cannot write a small k that would make the unit wrong. For similarity, for seconds, it is a small s. We cannot write a capital S because that might be a unit for something else. So in, for when we are writing units, it is important that we write the correct sim, the correct uh, uppercase or lowercase. Like in kg, both are small case, so we must write them small case. Writing them um, both as uppercase would make it wrong. Our next topic is about prefixes that are sometimes added before units and the powers that they have. But before we talk about that, it is essential that you all know about numbers given in standard form or scientific notation as they are called. So numbers that end with the power multiply by 10 to the power x. You might have seen this preposition a lot of times. Mostly in mathematics, we often write numbers in the powers of 10. For example, multiply by 10 to the power 9 or something like that. These are all numbers that are given in scientific form, scientific notation or standard form. Now, there are two major advantages of writing numbers like this. One is that it clearly shows how many significant figures a number has. So if I say uh, 6.2 multiplied by 10 to the power 3, you can see that 6.2 are the two numbers that have been given before, before the power of 10, right? So it shows that the number is significant to two figures, that is 6 and 3. Here, uh, sec the second advantage is that often we, in physics we have to write very large numbers. Like the example that is given here is the speed of light, right? It is a nine figure number, so like very large to write, right? If you have to commonly write this in a lot of times, it would be really, really, really problematic, right? And there are numbers that are even bigger than this. You might have studied the Avogadro's number in chemistry. So for numbers this big, it is often very convenient to write those in scientific form because it takes a lot, it takes much less space. Now the key of converting standard form to normal numbers is that you have to consider the power. For example, here the power was a positive eight. When the, whenever the positive, whenever the power is positive, you move the decimal places that many times to the to the right. Whereas when the power is negative, you move it to the left. So here the power of ten was a positive eight. So you move the decimal places eight times to the left, adding a zero each time. So we basically add eight zeros after the three because that's what the power shows. If instead the power had been a negative eight, we would the answer would have been 0, 0.000. Like we would have added eight zeros there and then a three. So the power, the the positive or the negative sign before the power is very very important while converting numbers from significant form 
into from standard form into normal figures. Here are some prefixes that are commonly used and the ones that you would be tested for in our O-level syllabus. Giga has a symbol G and it has a power of 10 to the power 9. So if a number, if, an, if any unit has uh, this symbol next to it, it means that, let's say we say gigawatt, it means the value of a simple watt multiplied by 10 to the power 9 or a 9 figure unit. Similarly, a mega has the symbol M, a capital M by the way, and 10 to the power 6. Kilo has a small, a small K, 10 to the power 3. Desi is 10, has a small D as its symbol, and it, it, the power is 10 to the power minus 1. This means that it, that it is smaller than a normal unit. So if we say one, 1 second is 10 times greater than 1 uh, deci second. Centi it has the symbol small c, and it has the power 10 to the power minus 2, whereas midi has a small m for its unit, and its power is 10 to the power minus 3. Micro has a, a sort of a u, it's a Greek letter by the way, and it stands for 10 to the power minus 6. Nano has a small n for its symbol, and it is 10 to the power 9. This is as far as you would study in O-level physics, and you would usually not be tested for anything less or greater than that. Again, the important thing here is the uppercase or the lowercase. For example, as you can see, milli and mega both have M. So it is very important that you write one as small m and one as capital M wherever you have to write mega or milli. Or, or if you mess that up, that would mean the opposite and that would be problematic. This is true for all of, the, all of these symbols. Whenever we are writing symbols, as I said last time, it is very important that we write them in the correct case. Next step, we will talk about how we can accurately measure physical quantities. And the first physical quantity that we are talking about here is time. Now, it is crucial that we are able to correctly measure time, not only because accuracy is very important in experiments, but also because time is often used in calculating other quantities such as the speed. Obviously, if we have the distance and we need uh, to calculate the speed, we would also need the time. So we need to be able to accurately measure time. And there are two possible ways to do this. The first is to use a stopwatch. The stopwatches are digital or analog depending on your display, with digital stopwatches usually being more accurate. The least count of a stopwatch is 0.1 seconds. What this means is that, that, that the least possible value that a stopwatch can measure is 0.01 seconds. This is called the least count, the smallest possible value that an instrument can measure. This also means that every answer, every value that a stopwatch gives me is correct to one hundredth of a second. So for example, a value that a stopwatch can give me is 6.73 seconds. As you can see, even after the decimal points, there are two more figures, so it's correct to one hundredth of a second. However, there are certain problems with the use of stopwatches, with the most notable one being that it, that it adds our own reaction time to the, to the actual time. What this means is that, you know, when we have to start recording, first our brain thinks that we have to start recording, then we manually press the start button, and both of these things take time. Similarly, at the end of it, when we have to stop recording, first our brain thinks about having to stop recording, which takes a certain time, and then we manually press the stop button, and that again takes time, and these times are added to the actual time. But you might be thinking, our thinking time cannot be that much, right? Like, come on, our brain isn't that slow. However, what we have to realize is that accuracy is extremely vital for our experiments. Even if the time that is added is like 0 0.01 second, it can be sometimes disastrous for our experiments just because we, uh, we value accuracy that much. So what we can do instead is use a pendulum. Now a pendulum is an instrument as you can see on the, on the far right. Uh, what in, in pendulum, uh, the, the terms that we need to know are the period and the oscillation. The oscillation refers to, the, uh, to, to one complete movement of the pendulum. What this means is that in the diagram on the right, when we release the pendulum from the right, the pendulum first travels to the, to the far left position and then back to its original position, the original position being the, uh, the black ball. So the, when we release the ball, the ball travels from right to left and then all the way back to the right. So this is called one complete oscillation. And the time it takes for this to happen is called the period of the is called the period of the pendulum. The way we calculate this, however, is that we measure the time for it, it takes for 50 such oscillations to take place, and then we divide it by 
number by the number of us by the by the seconds then we divide the time by the number of oscillations so for example if 50 oscillations take 40 seconds we can use simple maths to calculate the time it takes for one oscillation and that would come as 40 upon 50 seconds so 4 upon 5 seconds is the time it takes for one oscillation in this case so this is called the period of the uh, the period of the pendulum and we can use this to accurately measure uh, measure time and reduce our own reaction we have length now in the case of length there are several instruments that we often use to measure to measure it we have the tape measure we have the meter rule calipers uh, cal calipers vernier caliper and micrometer and they're all used to measure the length depending on how much the length actually is so the rule is this if the object is higher than if the object is bigger than one meter or higher depending on whatever we are measuring a tape measure is used because a tape is the longest instrument that we can that we use for measuring any length so for more than one meter we use a measuring tape now however for objects between 30 centimeter to one meter the, we use the meter rule now remember it's obviously called meter rule because it measures up to one meter so between 30 centimeter to one meter we use the meter rule. for in for uh, now for vernier caliper and micrometer it depends on how accurately we want, we want to measure our uh, our value so the vernier vernier caliper can measure up to 30 centimeters in length it cannot measure 40 or 35 centimeter it measures up to 30 centimeter whereas a micrometer can only measure up to 2 or 3 centimeter now you might think why this is like such a small value why would you keep an instrument that can only measure up to 3 centimeters well the reason for this is that a micrometer is the most accurate of these it measures it has a least count the least count again being the smallest possible value that it can measure so the least count of a micrometer is 0.01 mm millimeter whereas of a vernier caliper it is 0.1 millimeter as you can see from the chart the next physical quantity we will talk about is the mass but before we talk about how to measure mass accurately we have to have a clear understanding of the difference between mass and weight because often in our, in our surroundings, we use the words mass and weight interchangeably. And when we are talking about the weight, we are actually giving the mass of an object. So we need to have a clear understanding of their differences and what mass actually is. Well, for one thing, weight is a force. And as we learned from the previous slide, the SI unit of force is newtons. On the other hand, the SI unit of mass is kilograms. Now, mass is the amount of matter in a substance. And logically speaking, the amount of matter of the substance does not change because it does not depend on anything such as the location. Whereas the weight, it changes with, 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 the, with the placement of an object because in other words, it is, how much, it is the gravitational pull acting on an object. And we know that gravity is different in different scenarios. So let's say if you go to the top of a hill, the weight of the object there would be less than that on where when it was at the bottom of the hill. Or if we go to a different planet, the gravity would change and thus the weight will change. So while mass in normal scenarios remains constant, weight changes depending on the location. By Einstein's theory of relativity, mass does also change, but the change is so minimal that in our normal O-level calculations, we will consider the mass to be constant in all scenarios. Now, to measure mass, there are two, measures, uh, two major ways we can do that. The first one is to use an electronic balance. What an electronic balance does is that it actually detects the weight but uses it to give, give the mass. However, there is a certain problem with this. Because it is using the weight of an object to give the mass, uh, it, it gives different values in different places. So if we use the same, if we use the same electronic balance to measure the mass of an object on Earth and on the Moon, it would give two different values because the value of the weight changes. On the other hand, we can also use a beam balance as the such as the gear, one gear shown on the right. In the beam balance, on, it has two planes as you can see. So on one pan we put the weight, the object that we have to weigh, and on the other pan we put we put certain weights that we know. So we can so let's say to measure a 15 uh, 15 kg of 15 kg object, we put other objects with uh, with a weight 15 kg on the other pan. And when the object balances, it means they have equal weight. The good way, the good uh, point of using this, the major benefit of using this uh, actually, is that it gives same reading everywhere. 
because it does not depend on the gravitational pull. Objects of the same mass will have the same pull, so the beam balance gives the same reading regardless of where it is being used. This is the one major advantage that, uh, that a beam balance has on an electronic balance. While an electronic balance gives different readings in different places, the beam balance gives a universal play, universal uh, reading in all places. Well, this is, uh, this is it for this video. Subscribe and like for, for more content and we will continue with our series of, of O-level physics. So, uh, there are certain things regarding the, the, how to take values of the vernier caliper and the micrometer as well as zero error, parallax error and we will talk about these in the upcoming videos. Stay tuned and stay subscribed. Hit the bell icon and we will see you soon.